started. Welcome um, to the first Friday of North Central Region's Aging Network uh, webinars, our Friday webinars. And the first Friday of each month, it is related to gerontology. And I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker that we have today, Dr. Cleve Shields from Purdue University. He's a faculty member in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. And Dr. Shields has support from the National Institutes of Health to examine physician-patient communication. He recently received an NIDA grant to study physician-patient communication in opioid management and drug addiction in non-cancer chronic pain patients. He is also a faculty member of the Regan Streif Center for Healthcare Engineering the director of the Center on Poverty and Health um, Inequities within the Regan Street Center for Healthcare Engineering. Uh, Dr. Shields studies physician-patient communication in cancer care and pain management and with adolescents. He's also interested in health disparities due to race, poverty, and geographies such as rural or urban. So Dr. Shields, we're um, so delighted that you can join our uh, North Central Region Aging Network today, and I'm gonna turn it over to you for your presentation on helping old, older adults prepare for visits with their healthcare providers. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, so since it's a small group of us, if you wanna interrupt me as I go along, go right ahead, ask questions. So, So I'm going to talk a little bit about the changes in healthcare and why focusing on aging is important. I probably don't have to convince any of you of that. But healthcare used to, when I was young and uh, when my grandparents, it was all focused on acute illnesses. People died a lot more of, of uh, infections uh, than they used to uh, and, and than we do now. Although now, of course, we're starting to have antibiotic resistance. But not that many people developed chronic illness because people died sooner. Um, now people survive acute and infectious diseases and many of us live long enough that we end up with one or two chronic illnesses which require a different approach to communication. It used to be come in, get diagnosed. So here's a sort of short history of physician-patient communication. Um, used to be paternalistic, the physician was right, the patient was expected to follow orders and no one questions the doctor. Doctor's orders. Um, I wonder how I can, just a second. There we go. Um, I couldn't turn it. Um, and then there's the other extreme, which some people advocate today is the consumer centered where the patient is the expert, the patient sets the agenda. Not that that's a totally bad thing. Um, patients may have ideas about treatment that are counter to best medical advice. They may doctor shop. Um, whereas the model that's, that I work from and the model that people educate physicians about nowadays is what's called patient centered, a buzzword you've probably all heard. It talks about collaborative care, working together, uh, getting the input from the physician. They're both experts, physician and patient. Physician's an expert on medicine. Patient's an expert on themselves, their symptoms and their preferences. They know what's important to them. Physician skills, listening, drawing out patient's ideas and work to understand patient's perspective. That's a big part of patient-centeredness is that you you, you know, the old Yogi Berra, you can learn a lot by listening. Um, and so the goal is that patient and physician discuss and share decisions as appropriate and as prepared, preferred by patients. There are some patients who'd rather just the doctor make the decision and that's fine, but the doctor does need the physician, the patient's um, input. So what is patient-centered communication? It's um, I'm really bothered by my pain, the patient says. And then the physician says something like, I'm sorry to hear that, where does it hurt? So they're validating and exploring the patient's experience. So here's 
Another example, but PC is not. I'm really bothered by my pain. How's your mother doing? <laughs> so it shows the physician, the physician is not following up on the patient's concerns. Um, it's not that some people mistakenly think that patient-centeredness, patient-centered care and communication is all about introducing more psychosocial talk. It's a little bit about that, but for the most part, it's just really listening and finding out what's important to the patient and the patient's perspective on their problems. So for instance, um, oh, I already said this. So here's a little comic about the doctor talking to a patient. Of course, I'm listening to your expression of spiritual suffering. Don't you see me making eye contact, striking an open posture? leanings toward you and nodding empathically. So here is a report on showing the aging population in our country. Um, and you can see in our area that we have a little bit less aging, but we have a lot of people in our country and they're gonna, who are aging and they're the ones who consume most of the healthcare. Oops, wrong direction. There's so many, I didn't realize that I'm not gonna to try to explain that. So why, why is there actually, this is the percentage, the mean Medicare folks, Medicare, who go to the doctor, and some of them go more than 25 times a year, but the average is 17 contact days, 17 appointments a year for people on Medicare. Why all this contact? Well, a high percentage of us live into old age. We develop injuries. We develop chronic illnesses that can't be cured but have to be managed. So approximately 80% of older adults have at least one chronic illness, and 77% have at least two. Chronic illnesses are things such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, the debilitating uh, features of a stroke, and diabetes. And they account for two thirds of all deaths each year. Chronic diseases account for 75% of the money we spend on healthcare, 75%. And only 1% of health dollars are spent on public efforts to improve overall health. Chronic illnesses like diabetes affect 12.2 million Americans, age 60 and over, or 23% of the older population. Um, 57 million Americans age 20 plus have prediabetes. 90% of Americans age 55 and, uh, and older are at risk for hypertension, high blood pressure. And women are more likely than men to develop hypertension with half of women over 60 and 77% of women over 75 having hypertension. Wow, that's really fuzzy. I'll skip that. These didn't look that fuzzy when I put them in here. I'll just skip that. So what do we know about improving doctor visits? Well, there's been a lot of research done on what's called activation, where people bring in a list of questions uh, patients are, I, I did a study where we coached can breast cancer patients who were in remission after their treatment was done and going back to see the oncologist to ask, to make a list of questions to ask the doctor and take that list in with them. And what we found is that patients felt much more comfortable asking questions. They felt much more act, they felt empowered to ask questions and to be more part of the, the visit. And so activation is when patients ask direct questions, they request information, they ask for clarification, uh, they bring the, the physician back to their concerns if the physician hasn't addressed them. And if they don't understand something, they ask, doctor, one thing, is, a lot of time, times doctors will say, any questions? But a lot of times patients don't say anything because they feel perhaps dumb because they don't understand what the doctor was saying. Um, but the doctor won't know, or the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant won't know you don't understand unless you tell them. 
So what's a typical patient? Typical patients are passive. They may ask questions about what physicians recommend, but not very many. They express relatively few concerns. They appear satisfied with the information offered. They say that they understand even when physician explanations were lacking. So they just don't, they don't uh, advocate for themselves. So activation results in better communication, increased understanding between cl clinicians and patients, improved health outcomes, increased satisfaction with care, and increased adherence with the recommended treatment. So people have done things to try to increase activation. Phyllis Butow, an Australian psychologist, invented the question prompt list, which can be tailored to specific conditions. For instance, here's a booklet they put together for people at more the end of life who are seeking palliative care. And so they have, for instance, this one shows questions that a caregiver who might accompany a patient to uh, a visit might ask the doctor, what skills do I need as a carer? Do you think I can look after my partner, relative, or friend at home? Can I get help? What can I do if I'm not coping very well? How can I best support the person? What should I do if my partner won't eat very much? So you can see these are concerns, maybe perhaps somebody has cancer at the end of their life, or people with heart disease. They may be afraid too much exertion will kill them or something. Here's another example of a question prompt list by a friend of mine, Susan Egley. She, here are questions that patients could ask when they go in. They diagnosis, I asked him because I don't know what type of cancer I have, and the fact is I found it myself. Or I asked about, was the mammogram the possible cause of the cancer, or does it increase the size of the tumor? And a lot of people don't understand much about science, much about medicine, and so they need to ask these questions so they can figure out what's going on. Here's other questions. I did ask her what the point of chemotherapy was since we had a lumpectomy and so it was all removed. So people may not understand the notion, oops, of systemic treatment that you there may have been micrometastases of a, of a cancer throughout the body. Chemotherapy will help get those, hopefully, and increase life expectancy. Um, support services, if there are some, you can ask, you know, these question prompt lists have been developed by a number of different people to help patients seeking care figure out what they should ask. Because a lot of times people need examples. For surgery, here's one that's, that's been made up. Should I have surgery? What should I expect if everything goes well? And what happens if these things go wrong after surgery? And then, so here's a little pamphlet that people can hand out and say, well, look this over, be prepared. Or if you're accompanying somebody to a visit, uh, this will as a way to get them to talking about what they want and what they need from the visit. So my mother told me a story about a doctor's visit she had. My mother was a character. The physician was young. He had his hand on the doorknob and was ready to leave when he thought the session was over. My mother said, come back here, young man. We're not done talking. And my mom, was an assertive person, so she could do that. But it's harder for other people to do unless they lay out their concerns at the beginning so the physician will know what to listen for and know what, what is concerning people. So that's my presentation. Any discussion? I'm not a long-winded person. <laughs> well, thank you so much for... Um sharing this information and I think um, this was new to me as far as having the I, I guess I kind of understood it but didn't know there was terminology related to it but uh, understanding um, that we're moving more towards patient-centered care and that's great when we have this working relationship between the the patient and uh, the physician 
um, and I know my mother was the type of person that would never question or ask, you know, the doctors, like kind of that, um, the first one that you explained that, you know, the physician was always right and you don't question the doctor. Right. And I think the tips that you gave here on activation about us taking questions and, you know, asking directly uh, with questions that we have and what answers for and requesting information. I think that this is very helpful to know that we kind of have that right. So thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. Have time for discussion. If anyone um, wants to ask questions, we do have, one in the chat box, someone said, this is very a very important topic. Thank you. So what questions do you have? Another person wrote, um, Cleve, I've been in a situation where the physician talked with the caregiver and not the patient. How can we redirect so it is the patient-centered? That's a really good point. That's a good question. Um, that does happen, and yeah. I think I think the caregiver should mostly redirect the physician to talk to the patient. I know that it's, it's hard for a lot of people to do stuff like that, but you're you know you can always say, "Doctor, you really need to explain this to my mother. I'm I'm just here to support her," or something like that. But doctors do that, and it's very disrespectful. Yeah. Good advice. Thank you. So other qu questions do you have? Okay, another one just popped up here. Where can we access the brochures or pamphlets <clears throat> with question prompts to empower patients and caregivers? Great question. I think all of us would probably like to have copies of those. Um, well, I think one thing you could do is you, you could just Google quest and prompt list, and um, since Google's a verb now, you <laughs> yeah. quest and prompt list, and there's a whole bunch of them that are available just to print out on your own computer. So you could do them for cancer, you could do them for diabetes, um, and most of them, you know, you don't have to, you know, to write to somebody. I, I found one, I could, I could give it to Barb. I found one website with a whole bunch of them, um, so if you're, if you're look, if you're used to, um, um, oh, there's more people on here than I realized. Yeah. If you're used to, um, Googling that, you know, that you can find pretty much what you want. Question prompt list, you know, that's probably a good title to search under. Yeah, and if you want to share that website, we could always put it on our um, North Central Region Aging Network as a resource. Okay, so I can look that up and give it to you. Okay, that would be great because I'm sure that would be something that a lot of people would like and it'd be an easy uh, site to, you know, just to come to our website to get it anytime we need it. Yeah. Yeah, because the research is pretty solid that it's a helpful thing, and especially for people who are shy or like your mother who wouldn't challenge a doctor at all, unlike my mother. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me laugh when I think about her. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, Dr. Shields, thank you very much for uh, taking time to share with our small group today. It sounds like a lot of people benefited from, uh, benefited from this webinar. And uh, we want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise in this area. Well, thanks. It was fun. Thank you, thank you for joining us on our monthly North Central Region Aging Network, the first Friday of every month is our webinar on gerontology. And our third Friday of every month is a professional development webinar for extension uh, educators throughout the North Central Region. So uh, 
hopefully you'll join us again in another two weeks and then again the beginning of July. And you can always find the information at NCRAN, uh, ncran.org. And then if you go slash learn, that will uh, take you to the site uh, to connect for our webinars.